It is really for me a, a real great pleasure to introduce Eli to, to start off our series uh, this semester. If you look at Eli's CV, it's almost a story, what is a tale of two cities? It's like a tale of two different types of scientists. He is an ecologist on the one hand, trained as an ecologist, he's a card carrying ecologist, wildlife ecologist, has an undergraduate degree in wildlife ecology. His PhD is in wildlife ecology, but then his other personality is an environmental resource economist. And in fact, his PhD had a concentration in economics. His master's degree uh, is, is also in economics. So you've got ecology sandwiched with economics. If you look at where he's published and the types of things that he's been interested in, it's really at this intersection of cost-benefit analysis, evaluation, how do we measure things like sustainability, things that many of us are interested in, such as coupled human natural systems. Eli is actually trying to develop methods to measure that. How do you quantify sustainability? How do you quantify these transitions? Uh, he is, again, if you look at his CV and wh where he's published, he's published in a variety of different outlets, ecology journals and economics journals, as well as interdisciplinary science journals. If you look and see who has funded his work, it's, again, this mixture of uh, uh, perspectives. He, he's been funded by NSF, the National Institute for Health, uh, as well as uh, EPA and NOAA. So I think in many ways, Eli embodies the, the best of what we as a school have to offer as an interdisciplinary environmental scientist who's gr solidly grounded as an ecologist and an econ economist. So, Please join me in welcoming Eli Fenichel. Thank you, Karen. Can everyone, is, the, is the mic working? Is it? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so Karen, as Karen said, my work actually spans a, a wide number of uh, areas. I work on invasive species, I work on fisheries, I work on infectious disease, I work on payments for ecosystem service and reforestation and, and groundwater. But what I want to talk to you guys about today is some research that I really feel inspired to have done. I think this is part of, it was this research program long before I knew that it existed, which sort of led me down this sort of um, joint path of really wanting to think about ecosystems, the natural world is valuable, and why, why does that matter? How does that matter? What does it mean for a sustainable future? And I could have never put it in, that, in those words when I started. Um, the other nice thing about this, and to be able to give the first seminar of a semester here at FES, is I can also think about when this research program was actually starting. I, would, I had just come to Yale. I was beginning to think about, well, how would we measure the value of natural capital in a way that's credible? Because I'm going to show you that's really important for thinking about sustainability. And I was having, I don't, we were, Matt and I were having lunch, or maybe we were having a beer, I don't remember. And Matt says to me, um, you know, walking around Yale, I see these buildings. And it's amazing. I think to myself, I need to think bigger thoughts. And so this partly inspired me to have sort of the courage to pursue this research. And it stuck with me as I need to think bigger thoughts. So I want to challenge all of you, particularly first year students who are now just at Yale, take the awe and the inspiration as we walk around our, our Harry Potter-esque campus and think bigger thoughts. Um, so with that, I'm going to start talking about this idea of measuring the value of natural capital, what that means for the wealth stored in ecosystems, and ultimately what that means for thinking about sustainability. Uh, this work is supported, this work is actually supported mostly by the Knobloch Family Foundation um, with some support from the National Science Foundation. And I've had a number of people who are either past collaborators on some of the work I'm going to show you or people currently working with me and are still structuring the way that I'm thinking about this. The other reason that it's nice to be able to give the first seminar is I get to start off with our new vision statement. Um, so uh, as some of you may know, FES uh, has a new vision statement. And FES's vision statement is knowledge and leadership for a sustainable future. So I wanted to think about what does this mean? Well, we're an academic institution. We're clearly interested in knowledge. We teach, which means we're interested in the future. We think of ourselves as a leading university and a leading school in this field, so clearly we're interested in leadership. So a bunch of places around Yale could have had those words. The only other substantive word in our vision statement is sustainable. And I feel like far too often we sometimes fall back and use sustainable as a synonym for good. But everybody wants to be good at what they do. So we must mean something um, more specific than that. So when I start thinking about what does sustainability mean, I go back to the Brundtland Commission. 
Uh, this was published in uh, the late 80s. Uh, most of the work was, of course, done throughout the 80s to run up to this, that really defined sustainable development in the, in the policy context. And, and the Brundtland Commission uh, published as Our Common Future is sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. I want to unpack that a little bit. So clearly, current generations matter. The ability um, for present generations to meet their needs matters. Moreover, it says without compromising the ability of future generations. It doesn't say is going to guarantee or provide. It just says not compromise. It also says ability, not guarantee. Right? So it's actually a little bit more narrow than we might at first think. OK, so this gives us some guidance. But um, if you walk out the building and over to SOM, you might hear this, this phrase, what gets measured gets managed. It's often attributed to Peter Drucker, a famous management consultant. Drucker wrote something closer to what gets measured gets improved. Um, it turns out that he was actually paraphrasing um, Lord Kelvin of absolute zero f fame, so somebody uh, actually very interested in measurement. Um, so we need to, to fully define a concept like sustainability. It's not going to be fully defined until we have a way of measuring it. And what we're going to learn when we try and do that is it might not encompass all our wants and wishes for this concept, but it'll give us something useful. And this is what Robert Solow, a Nobel Prize winning um, economist, said in the early 90s. And he's writing about sustainability. He says, talk without measurement is cheap. A few numbers, even approximate numbers, would be much more effective in turning the discussion toward concrete proposals and away from pronunciamatos. And so what he's trying to say here, again, is this idea that measurement is really important. It's not the end, but it's a means for structuring the way we think about things. So at the same time in the, in the 90s, um, there were a group of economists um, really led by uh, Partha Disgupta and Karl Garn Mahler, uh, who, along with a bunch of other economists, who were trying to think about how would we measure sustainability. And most of these economists came to the conclusion that sustainability is something like non-declining welfare, and we need to define welfare. But what they go on to show is that that can be approximated by non-declining wealth. If we define wealth broadly to include a portfolio of sort of the traditional forms of capital we might think about, like buildings and, and financial capital, as well as human capital, and importantly, natural capital. One of the interesting co um, contributions of uh, Partha Disgupta and Karl Gorn Mahler was they also said, we don't want to assume that economies optimally allocate resources. If, you know, my take on this is if economies really were perfect and optimally allocated all of resources, I wouldn't be standing here right now, and most of us wouldn't be as worried about the environment as we are. Um, so that was really, they were able to show that this definition can hold in an economy that isn't necessarily optimally allocating resources, but in, in the economies we actually live in, in the worlds we live in, this can still be useful. And what I find somewhat interesting about this is, so um, I, I highly recommend Partha's book, um, uh, Human Well-Being in the Natural Environment, but I also, rec we were very fortunate last year to have Pam Matson and Bill Clark here talking about their new book, and neither of them are, are, are economists. And if you read through their, their whole, this, this actually great book on pursuing sustainability, it really starts with this foundation of non-declining wealth as the way of thinking about sustainability. And, and Descupta parses the, the capital asset classes differently than Matson and Clark, but you know, ultimately they're talking about the same concept. What's interesting is there's, um, <laughs> this is a great concept, and, and theory is, is useful. Um, but a, another uh, economist who I think is, is quite insightful is Shuck Smulders. And in 2012, he wrote that um, the Achilles heel of all these wealth accounting ideas and using non-declining wealth to measure sustainability is how do you get the correct prices to value natural capital, right? And that's what he saw as, as the major stumbling block. And so that's what I wanted to think about. So where does this idea of natural capital actually come from? Well, a lot of us, have, we've been hearing it a lot lately, I think. Um, there have been, uh, and part of the reason is that nature is a productive base that can sustain a flow of services, which makes it a great metaphor, capital a great sort of metaphorical use. Um, and lots of groups have gotten in, into the game here. So um, there was an Obama executive order about including natural infrastructure, which could have been read as capital and ecosystem services and federal decision making. I don't know if this still exists or not. Um, there's the UNEP has, has started publishing a series of inclusive wealth reports. The 2017 report is in the works right now, um, and I think will be coming out next in 2018. Um, the World Bank 
has established a number of accounts and is working with a number of countries to actually develop country level wealth accounts to measure sustainability from countries like the UK to India. Um, there's been a lot of writing in, in journals like PNAS, which is probably the, the foremost um, publication outlet for, for real interdisciplinary science around sustainability. And then um, even The Economist magazine has been doing reporting on sort of this idea of inclusive wealth or de defining wealth accounts broadly uh, for focusing on sustainability. But this is not a new idea. It's actually a very old idea. Um, there's a seminal textbook um, in economics, accounting, and finance written by Irving Fisher. Irving Fisher was actually the first person to earn a PhD from Yale in economics and later became a professor here. In 1906, he writes this book called The Nature of Capital and Income. And page two of the book, the very first example he gives of a capital asset is Newfoundland fish stocks. He goes on throughout the book to write about public lands as an important form of capital. It, it's very easy to read this and see that he's thinking of things of natural resources as capital assets that provide ecosystem services. He also writes a lot about human capital if you're interested in those, those ideas. Um, also in the early 1900s, Teddy Roosevelt gives a speech to the Colorado Livestock Association where he says the nation behaves well if it treats natural resources as assets, so we can think about that as capital, which it must turn over to the next generation increased and not impaired in value. So if we take the Brundtland definition of sustainability, we only focus on the natural environment, we pair that with the Desgupta Matson sort of idea of non-declining wealth as a measure of sustainability, Roosevelt beat them by 100 years. Okay. So where are we today, actually? So I want to clarify w how I think about capital. Um, and I think it's actually different than the way many economists think about um, capital slightly, is I think we often think about capital as getting value f as a substitute for labor. It provides productive activities. But value in economics comes from exchange. It comes, and so what we're really worried about is capital is how we take opportunities that we could, could use today and we store them for tomorrow. So it's actually a way of exchanging opportunities through time or passing on abilities, which is what that Brundtland definition suggests that we should be doing. So what are, what are, where are we actually? So it turns out that um, countries look to the UN, uh, UN stat. Um, they have what they call the system of accounts publication. It's incredibly boring to read and incredibly thick. And it guides the way countries compute things like GDP and maintain their national accounts. Well, chapter 10 of this is all about capital accounts. And it turns out a huge chunk of chapter 10 is actually devoted to thinking about many kinds of natural capital. Not all the kinds we might care about here at FES, but certainly many, um, though I think few countries are actually implementing this yet. And then as I said, the World Bank and um, UNEP are developing a number of accounts. There's a whole bunch of experimental accounts and environmental accounts being developed. But again, the problem comes back to this issue that Chuck Smulders brought up, which is where do you get the prices? And the issue is not so much, I think we're getting rapidly better at measuring the quantities of things that are natural capital, but we still have this struggle of what, how to price it. Because in order for thinking about prices and this wealth accounting approach to be helpful for measuring sustainability, it needs to be an apples to apples comparison with our traditional forms of capital. Um, and I think that's where, where we've gotten ourselves in trouble sometimes is we're not careful to, to ensure that we have this apples to apples comparison. So that's a lot of what I've been thinking about. And in uh, 2014, Josh Abbott and I wrote a paper in the, Journal of the, uh, in, in the Journal of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, where we went back to sort of foundational principles in capital theory and said, where would you get a price for natural capital, assuming that the economy is not optimally allocating that capital through time? Um, and what we show in that paper is our derivation in 2014 is effectively the exact same thing that Dale Jorgensen came up with writing in 1963 in the American Economic Review, which is a foundation of how we think about the value of invested capital and why capital asset prices on Wall Street work the way they do. Okay, so that was nice. Um, and then a couple years later with some other co-authors, Josh and I uh, published sort of a, a slightly refined version of that um, in PNAS. And what I like to say is the biggest difference between our work and Jorgensen's work is we published ours in this beautiful colored diagram, which is very friendly, and Jorgensen's is published in a typeset 
the 1960s typeset economics journal, um, which is a little more painful, just visual, it's not as aesthetically pleasing. And it's very unusual that a scientist gets to stand up and say, I discovered something 50 years after the original person and it's still a contribution. But the key contribution here is everything Jorgensen did um, can actually be applied to natural capital and it can preserve that apples to apples comparison. Let me walk you through this framework a little bit. So we're gonna start off with stocks of natural capital. And when I say stocks, I'm talking about physical quantities. So we've applied our work actually to groundwater and to fish so far. In the 2016 paper, we actually, just for fun, apply it to housing prices because we could observe everything and show that the whole framework holds up and there are no real surprises. Um, so we have stocks, these stocks, influence what we can think of as the, the, the growth rate or the ecology of those stocks, which then feed back into the, the amount of resource we have. Those stocks influence human behavior. They influence something we're gonna call capital gains. They influence the benefits we get from the environment. So they really feed through the entire system, okay? The other thing that we want, and so ultimately at the other end we get a price, and you can see there's a little formula in here that I'll, I'll blow up in a minute, but before we blow that up, I wanna point out that if we wanna think about a world we're not going to assume that natural resources are optimally allocated um, through time. We need to actually put in something we call the economic program or the resource allocation mechanism. We need to go out and empirically understand how is it that resources are being allocated um, to understand how they're being valued today. Um, so we need to start off with policies and institutions and understand how those shape human behavior and how that human behavior feeds into the benefits we get and into the, the changes in ecosystems. Okay, and then ultimately we're gonna price out, we'll take the prices and quantities, and we'll understand the inclusive wealth contribution. Let me blow up that equation for a bit. So here we have the price on the left-hand side, this might be what we're looking for, is the value of natural capital, or the price of natural capital. Um, it's really a, a relatively simple looking formula that's got four parts. Um, the first part, and so the question we should ask is can we measure these things to get the price, right? That's the important question. Um, so the first thing here is the change in capital service flows or the change in dividends that we get from stocks or physical stocks of natural capital. And what I'll say about this is that since the 1960s um, and perhaps even before, environmental economists have worked really hard on this. And for a large number of ecosystem services and stocks of natural capital, we can do pretty good. We can certainly do much better than zero. There's lots that can still be done. I don't wanna say the problems are completely solved, but this field has made tremendous progress, okay? Um, so we can, we can do this pretty well for some things. I'm gonna come down here, a, a, another term here is a discount rate. Discount rates can be highly controversial. Um, I'm happy to talk about them later if people really want to. Um, but at the end of the day, if we wanna make apples to apples comparisons, what I'm gonna say is we should just use the public accounting authority's established discount rate so that we're preserving that apples to apples comparison, which is a good place to start, okay? This is the term that actually has me the most excited about this because of sort of this, this one foot in ecology and one foot in economics that I've had my whole career. Um, is this is where changes in the growth rate of the stock enter sort of directly into the price, okay? And what are changes in the growth rate of the stock? Well, you know, if we imagine the world without people, it's the bread and butter of ecologists and natural scientists. It's where the science really matters. It feeds right in here. But increasingly, if you go read Oz Schmitz's new book, you know that we can't ignore people and ecosystems. So we're increasingly also worried about interfacing with social science, economics, um, as well as natural science to have good descriptions of human behavior that are also conditioned on the prevailing institutions and governance arrangements. So we need to understand those as well. And we need to be able to build a predictive model. So we, we have these three things. Now I've got this thing I'm calling capital gains, which cannot be directly observed, nor there, neither can price for natural capital, um, which makes me think you should be saying, Eli, there's a problem here. You just came out of teaching your applied math class and you're showing me one equation and two unknowns. Um, but what we can do is we can use, it turns out that capital theory allows us another equation that lets us recover this with some approximation techniques. And I'll, I'll sort of talk about that briefly today. Um, what I wanna say also is we've developed an R package that boils down a lot of those techniques to make it very easy for other people to do. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Let me walk you through sort of the steps of how this actually gets operationalized. What we fundamentally need is a socio-ecological systems model. And I don't necessarily mean this in the Lynn Ostrom framework, I mean this in sort of a generic way. Um, what we're gonna find is we're gonna de define a list of stocks of capital. These, we can think of these as all being natural capital, but it turns out our framework could work with other forms of capital as well. Um, a list of natural capital. Oh, the other thing I should say before I go on, pay attention to the colors, things are gonna be color-coded. It's not just, uh, not just for aesthetics. Um, so 
stocks of natural capital, they have feedbacks to human behaviors, and that, so we can have a list of stocks, we can have a list of human behaviors, those lists don't have to be the same length. I'm showing you the formal math down below if you wanna read it. Those human behaviors are nested inside institutions which define how they feed back to affect those stocks, okay? Some things we need to know here um, are we, we wanna make sure we can define this in ways that can be measured with data. And we need to ultimately balance complexity and tractability. So we can think about is a stock the population of an organism? Is it the population by age? Is it the population by age and sex? Is it the population by age, sex, and name? At some point this becomes untractable and we do have to sort of lump things together. Um, the other thing we wanna say here is that human, the, the, one of the implicit assumptions here is that human behavior responds reasonably fast or relatively fast to changes in the environment. If human behaviors don't change relatively quickly to um, changes in the environment, what really all we have to do is introduce more stocks of capital because that's sort of how um, what's mediating those time lags or the speed at which humans are adjusting to environmental change. Um, then we, can t we have to take this system and we have to say, well, we have to establish some sort of well-being index at a point in time, okay? And that's what I was calling dividends. I also like to think of it as income. Um, and I have income in quotes here. But this is, you know, one of the interesting things is Irving Fisher wrote about income that doesn't pass through the cash drawer. So he's talking about all the things that make well life worth living when he's talking about income, okay? And that's the way I'm thinking about this. Um, and then, so we're gonna establish this income index, which I'm gonna call W, as a function of all of the stocks in all of the actions people are taking, okay? And it turns out because these actions are feedbacks, can be defined as feedbacks from the stocks empirically, um, we can write this as just functions of the state of the world, but I think this is actually more conceptually easier um, to think about it this way. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that you can, have, you can get income or benefit flows from the mere existence of just coming right out of the stock, if we can figure out how to measure that, or from the actions we're taking, like potentially harvesting a, a fish from a fish population. Um, so what are we going to do then? So to, to get back to the Descripta Mahler definition, we want non-declining welfare, or specifically intertemporal welfare, um, which we're going to define as the sum of those well-being indices through time, okay? And we're going to discount. So this is really the expression to look at here. Um, I'm going to use V as my, my notation for intertemporal welfare. Uh, integral sign is just a summation. We're going to sum from an arbitrary time t to forever because we um, sustainability doesn't have an end date, right? Um, and t could be today, it could be some point in the future. This bit here is just a discount. This is just discounting and it's just, um, this is respecting the fact that most public accounting authorities do discount future benefits and this, these are the benefits, okay? So this is just a formal way of saying what Descripta and Mahler and, and now um, Pam Matson and Bill Clark and others are saying, which is that we wanna think of sustainability as non-declining welfare through time. And that hopefully this can be approximated um, through non-declining wealth. Now if we go and look at how prices are actually defined very broadly outside of our framework, uh, the price is by definition the change in this intertemporal welfare with respect to a change in a given stock. Okay, so the price of stock I um, is a change in welfare with respect to stock I. So from this, two important features fall out. First, the, the price or the shadow price or the accounting price of stock I is a function of the quantities of all stocks. This means we can change stock J, hold stock I constant, but stock I's price can still change. So sort of by analogy, something you might, you might have seen in an introductory economics class is the price of hamburger buns, if you have a fixed number of hamburger buns, the ha price of a hamburger bun might change if the number of hamburgers in the world changes, right? Um, so, so that's just an example of, of how that might work, and I'm gonna show you a, an example in ecosystems in a few minutes. Um, the other thing is it's actually this condition that I was referring to that allows us to solve that uh, one equation, two unknowns problem. So, and we do that through a series of, um, functional approximation techniques that I, I don't want to get into the weeds of today. Suffice to say, we actually have three. One works really well in multidimensional problems, but does a little more approximation. One tends to operate well at the level of data that we tend to be most comf confident in. And one actually does a minimal amount of approximation, but asks the most out of the data. So depending on the problem you have, you might choose a different approximating technique. We've bundled all of these into a package 
that right now only exists in R. We're hoping to translate it into some other languages in the future. Um, we call it cap N or capital asset pricing for nature. Um, and basically, if you can build that socio-ecological systems model and come up with a well-being index at a point in time, then you can use our package to recover basically a price curve. So here we have stock size, here we have accounting price or shadow price or natural capital asset price on the y-axis, and it's giving us the price curve. And it comes with a number of examples. You can download it um, from the CRAN package, and if this is really interesting to you, you should think about signing up for my spring class because we use this on problem set two. Um, Okay, so um, let me go through the, if this example is actually in the CAPN package. It's actually the example we first published in 2014, and I think it's a really good one for building some intuition about what's going on. Um, so we looked at the Gulf of Mexico reef fish complex with data that ran up to about 2005. Um, so we had data for, sent for almost two decades, I think, um, to, to calibrate this. Um, we're gonna treat the entire reef com uh, complex of reef fish as a single stock. Um, there's actually 62 jointly managed species, but six of them make up most of the commercial catch. And I'm actually gonna, there's an incredibly important recreational fishery in the Gulf of Mexico that we're, we are starting to think about a little bit. In this work, we just pretended that it didn't exist. So you can think of this as perhaps a bit of a bias, but still probably better than zero. Um, this is a red snapper. It's the red snapper is the most important of these six species. In 1984, so a while ago, uh, everyone agreed the fishery was, was overfished and poorly managed and agreed to a um, fishery management plan to rebuild the stock based on maximum sustained yield. And they used um, a very complex set of regulations. And you can see a list of them here. And what I like to say is in my spring class, we use a, a textbook that has a chapter on thinking about managing fisheries and a sub-chapter on how not to manage a fishery. And that's kind of what they did all at once. Um, and so one of the reasons we chose this is some colleagues of ours, Junji, uh, Junji Jang and Marty Smith, had, had when we started working on this, had recently written a series of papers that got us like 90% of the way to having that socio-ecological systems model. And basically what they do is they model the entire, this entire complex of fish as a logistic growth equation, stock on the x-axis, change in stock over change in time on the y-axis, or harvest on the y-axis. They get this logistic growth curve here. Um, and then they go on in the second paper to model how, how fishermen respond to changes in the fish stock, and that's this curve here, okay? So where those two cross, that's sort of what we would think of as this equilibrium of the system, and it turns out that's the stock size and the harvest level that actually persisted in the fishery for really uh, over a decade up until 2005, okay? Then sort of hovered right around there. One thing you should see is that this is much lower than the maximum sustained yield, and the biomass is actually le much lower than the biomass that supported the maximum sustained yield. So anyway, we took these data. This is this highly inefficient fishery um, with really complex institutions. And we, ran, we didn't run it through our CAPN package. The CAPN package didn't exist yet, but it's sort of the, the ancestor of the CAPN package. Um, and what I'm showing you this is because the CAPN package and all of the different approximators actually give the exact same result for this system. This is the stock size, what I called calibration stock size is actually the stock size that persisted in 2005. And what we see here is that we get a natural capital asset price of about $3 a pound. And so the way to think about this is what we're saying is a fish left out in the water, a pound of fish left out in the water is worth about $3. This is not the value that fishermen got. This is the value in terms of passing on future opportunities for future fishing. It's the value in reproduction and growth of that fish. Okay? You can think of it as the opportunity cost of catching that fish and bringing it to the dock as a, as a, a dead hunk of protein. Turns out that price was $2. I, I don't think you have to be too business savvy to realize that if you have a capital asset that you value as $3 in the future and you're selling it as $2 today, that's not great business sense, okay? So fortunately for us as scientists, and I think also um, certainly fortunately for the resource and for the fishery and the fishermen that depend on it, in 2007 there was a, sh a major shift in institutions. Um, there's the introduction of something called catch shares. These are also sometimes called individual tradable quotas or ITQs. Those of you who study climate might know this as cap and trade. So what the idea here was is they were gonna set a total amount of catch that could be caught, they were gonna allocate it to fishermen, and then tell the fishermen, sort it out amongst yourself. Trade it around, do what you need to do, figure it out, just don't go over um, the catch, okay? And they didn't quite do that, that's what they would have done in theory. There were still a bunch of regulatory restrictions. One of the interesting things about these catch shares programs is they create an institution that reveals a price. 
that we might be able to compare to. Theory says that it, um, these ITQs should raise the value over these other management schemes. And what we see is for Red Snapper in 2007 when they started this program, Red Snapper traded at just under $9 a pound. We thought this was really interesting because it was higher than our price, but it was the same order of magnitude, which gave us some comfort. And it's given a lot of other people comfort that we're, what we're getting is quite credible um, as, a, as sort of a comparison. I think it also shows a few other important things if you buy, if you buy those numbers. Um, first, it shows that better management actually affects the value of natural capital. So the value of natural capital is not some parameter to be, go out to nature and look under a rock and recover. It's fundamentally dependent on how we're managing the capital. That's not surprising. How well you take care of your card is going to depend on how, how or your house that helps define the value of, of that, that, that form of capital. The other thing is it shows, I, I liken this to sort of restructuring an underperforming firm and seeing the share price triple. The other thing is I think this gets to one of the issues that we've struggled, that economists have struggled with, which is that we like to impose this idea of an optimal, of a, you know, optimally managed um, system or optimal prices, and that's what we should be using. But it turns out if we always assume the system is optimally managed, we can't actually pick up these improvements in the value of natural capital from management improvements. People might also be concerned if we allow our institutions to erode, we won't pick up the losses as well. So the institutions are fundamentally linked to the value of natural capital. Okay, so let me connect that back to sustainability. Um, we said that sustainability, we're gonna say, requires non-declining non welfare or that this intertemporal welfare is positive or increasing through time. We can think of that as, again, passing on, the ability to pass on as least as much potential as we inherit, okay? Um, we, we're gonna use this funny shape W to, to talk about wealth. Wealth is an accounting identity defined as price times quantity, okay? And this has often led people to say that this is what's called a weak sustainability index because it suggests that everything is a substitute for everything else. But it's not as soon as you realize that it's not actually linear in the stocks and that these prices depend on the stocks themselves, okay? And so this actually helps us handle limits to substitution. And I'll show you that in a few moments with an example. It's relatively trivial to show that a change in welfare, a very tiny, so this, when you have a D here, this is a very tiny change. So a very tiny change in welfare is equal to a very tiny change in wealth, which is just equal to some constant price times the change in the stock. Okay, this is not, um, this is pretty easy to show, but it's also pretty trivial because if the changes are that small, I don't care, right? Um, and it's also not the way we collect data. Our data tend to come over longer time periods where these changes might be substantial. So we wanted to think very carefully about, well, is a change in welfare equal to a change in wealth if we have non-trivial changes, okay? And it turns out it can be, but we have to be very careful about what we think of as this constant price. And that constant price has to be some average of the price at the beginning of the evaluation period and the price at the end of the evaluation period. But it can only be our typical sort of arithmetic mean under very restricted conditions. And we're curious about how big a deal is that. Let me show you that graphically. So this is the price curve I showed you from um, the Gulf of Mexico case. Uh, remember the price is defined as the marginal change in the value in, in that, that intertemporal wel welfare measure. So the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that the area under the curve, if we go from say stock one to stock two, and we have these price changes, that's gonna be the welfare loss. This is not what happened in the Gulf of Mexico, it was just a convenient curve for me to draw, to show you this graphically rather than with, with algebra, okay? So the welfare loss is this yellow region, but the wealth measured at time one is this blue rectangle, while the wealth measured at time two would have been the purple rectangle. If we subtract the purple rectangle from the blue rectangle, it probably doesn't equal the area of the yellow rectangle, right? People should, that, that's fairly obvious. If we establish an average price, then what we're doing is we're subtracting this rectangle from this rectangle. Does that look a little bit better? It looks a little better because now we have a omission error and a commission error that could potentially be offsetting, right? That, that's what's going on here. Um, it turns out if rather than a, a, a curve like this one, we had a straight line, we could go back to a Euclidean geometry and we know that this triangle will always exactly equal that triangle. And so the errors are exactly offsetting, okay? But what that means is that there's some other weighted average of prices that exists such that we can always make these two areas equal. And this is where I kind of feel like sometimes the dog starts, or the tail starts wagging the dog, so to speak, is I don't, I am 
very realistic that my research will never upend the international regime of accounting, nor should it. Um, but what this means is that if we can measure changes in welfare, we can come up with a price that will work in an accounting scheme that will do exactly what the theory says it's supposed to do. And I'm super excited about that. Um, so let me give you an example of how this would really play out, because really, thinking about sustainability, if you only have one capital stock is really trivial, but it's really hard to draw in more than one dimension. Um, so I want to talk about the Baltic Sea. Um, so this comes from a paper we published uh, last summer um, with a number of colleagues in PNAS, where we took, we went from a, a, thinking about this in terms of one stock to thinking about this in terms of multiple stocks and how they interact, and what that means for changes in welfare, what that means for changes in wealth. And how does this all hang together? So here's the Baltic Sea. There's 14 countries around the Baltic Sea. Fortunately, all but one of them are part of the EU. And I'm really just going to ignore the one that's not. We're going to pretend that they behave right in line with, with everyone else. Um, pretty big assumption, I know. Um, OK, fishing is an important industry. The other nice thing about the Baltic Sea is it's a super simple ecosystem in this respect. There's three species that make up 88% of the revenue. Cod, which is a predator. Herring and sprat, which are, are prey for cod. Okay, um, the EU, the way these, this this fishery works at sort of the, the Baltic Sea scale is the EU members work together under um, an organization called ICES to do a what they call a stock assessment to measure the fish. They set a total allowable catch, and then every year the countries get a fixed fraction of that total allowable catch. Okay, and we're going to use data from Poland, and Poland's been part of this system since 2004. Um, so one of the big concerns, so here we have year on the x-axis, stock biomass on the y-axis. Here we've got cod, sprat, and herring. Um, this is when Poland joins the EU. Um, but in the 80s and 90s, there was a decline in, in the cod stock. And cod are the tasty predator, right? That's, that's the one that everybody thinks is the yummiest. Maybe not everybody, but the market seems to suggest people think it's the yummiest. And so people are concerned about this decline. We should also, now that we're talking about Poland a little bit, we're going to we do make the assumption that, that this is that Poland's reasonably representative. Um, what Poland does is once they get their share, they then allocate it to their fishing vessels with a fixed quota. So unlike the Gulf of Mexico, fishing vessels in quota in Poland are not allowed to trade their quota amongst each other. So if if we give Edgar a fixed share, he can't trade with Karen even though they might like to. That's the rules in Poland. Okay. The other thing about this fishery is that. Um, fishermen have a really hard time targeting these three species. So they tend to catch them together. So if your quota is out of whack of how your boat would produce, you're going to be left over with some quota and some other quota. And because you can't trade, we also want to worry about what the net revenue or the profit that fishermen are, are making. Um, the other thing that was, this is like one of the best things to happen to you when you're writing a paper. Um, we started writing this paper in about 2015, and people were sort of punting around with this idea of, a multi-species stock assessment and a multi-species maximum sustained yield, which was like ideal for people who worry about ecosystem-based management. Right? They thought this would be, be great. So we're like, OK, we'll set up our code so we can simulate that. But business as usual, and the way, way uh, the world was living in 2015 when we started, was they did single-species stock assessment. They set single-species quotas. They didn't take account of the ecological interactions among these, these fish. Well, it turns out this year they changed to this other um, system, this ecosystem-based management system, so we're able to sort of think about what that means. So I'm going to show you results for both. Um, just to give you a sense of what this, this model looks like, this socio-ecological systems model, uh, Barbara likes to call it a uh, multi, multi-species coupled interactions model. So we updated some of her earlier work. It's fairly complicated. I think this captures a lot of the complication of a lot of sort of the cutting edge models used to manage ecosystems today. We have three species. They actually are divided into eight age classes. The cod have predation preferences on their two prey. The prey can die from getting eaten. All of these, these fish species grow. Um, they can experience what's often called natural mortality. Really, that should just be any other mortality other than not enumerated in the model. Um, there's a harvest mortality that comes from gear selectivity. Different vessels can have different gears. There is a model of this process of setting the tack and allocating it to Poland, and Poland allocating it to 411 fishing vessels, where we've estimated the vessel-specific vessel production functions. Then we simulate these vessels trying to maximize their profit subject to the state of the world and their quotas. Um, and we do this at over 8,000 different uh, combinations of the three stocks. Um, this takes a little less than 24 hours on Yale's high-performance computing. Um, 
but we're ultimately going to boil it back down to these three stocks. So I just wanted you to realize that this actually is a fairly, um, so we go through some technical hoops to sort of compress things back to three stocks. Um, blue is cod, green is herring, red is sprat, um, year biomass. And the key thing to notice from this figure is that these multi-species maximum sustained yield or ecosystem-based management, in the long run, we wind up with less cod, but we wind up with more prey fish. That's what the, the ecologists who are, have been worried about this is that if you overexploit your prey fish, then you can't support predators, so you want more, more prey, fewer predators. That's kind of part of the, the mantra of ecosystem-based management in fisheries. A few months ago, some leading fishery scientists started questioning this again, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, the, so we get the reverse when we go back to business as usual. This is year, this is sort of the profit. Um, the black line here is the business as usual case. The blue line is the ecosystem-based management case. So it looks like profits in the future for ecosystem-based management actually look better as well. So we can take, this is basically our coupled systems model. We can take that and we can actually use it in our cap end package. Um, this is a very complicated figure um, because I can't draw in more than really two dimensions. So I've got cod, herring, and sprat biomass. I've got their shadow price or their capital asset price on the y-axis, okay? And I'm trying to, and what I have to do is I have to hold the other stocks fixed at some level to be able to draw this in, these, in a two-dimensional space. Um, so I'm gonna hold things fixed at the dashed lines at their steady states and the solid lines at the 2013 stock levels. The blue refers to if the prevailing institutions are the ecosystem-based management institutions and the red, cur the red curves are if the prevailing institution is that single species um, business as usual case. The black curves are some sensitivity analyses that we do in the paper. This black circle tells you where the stock was in 2013 and then the X vessel price or the price that fishermen actually got for dead fish when they brought them to the dock, just for reference. What we see um, at 2013 stock under business as usual, cod uh, has a very positive shadow price. It's actually well above what they're getting at the, at the dock, much like what was happening in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but herring and sprat are actually negative. What's going on here is what we're saying is the prevailing institutions are telling us to behave as if we're going to treat these things like liabilities, like they're pests that we should be getting rid of. Okay, that doesn't seem right. What we find is if we actually let the system play out under business as usual, um, the story flips. We wind up treating cod as well. We wind up with too many cod, and then prey fish, you know, prey fish are scarce. because There's too many cod, so they have a negative price. Um, but when we go to the multi-species maximum sustained yield ecosystem-based management approach, it turns out at least at that the equilibrium that we think would prevail there, uh, all species are, are managed as assets. We thought that was kind of interesting. This is actually the coolest slide of my talk. When I made these figures, I just sort of fell out of my chair, okay? It's really cool. But like fine art, I probably need to walk you through it. Um, so what we need to do, so what we were interested in is I said, remember I said there's this criticism of this idea that it's everything is a substitute for everything else in this framework. And I said, no, that's not the case. Well, that's what this figure shows. So what I'm showing here is the biomass of herring on the x-axis, sprat and cod. I'm holding the other species fixed. Um, in this case, at the steady state, um, for the business as usual case, it doesn't really matter. What these curves show is these are level sets or contour lines of the asset price for herring. I can make similar figures for other combinations. Um, if these curves slope up, that's really surprised me at first, okay, that these curves would slope up. Because in the payoff function, in that income function, it's quantity times price plus quantity times price plus quantity times price. It's this, things are perfect substitutes. Okay. Here though, if these curves slope up, what that means is that herring and cod are complements. You can think about this complementary relationship as an extreme lack of substitution. Okay, what it means is that um, if you have more of one, it makes the other one more valuable, not less. Right, that's the hamburger bun hamburger example. Okay, um, so we thought that was kind of interesting. And then we look here, and so here's our two prey, prey species. Here these curves slope down. They are substitutes. But notice, these are not straight lines, they are actually curves. They don't have the same slope everywhere. What that means is that just how substitutable a ton of herring is for a ton of, of sprat changes as the state of the world changes. So this is, th what we're saying here is that if we 
measure the prices correctly, we can pick up limits of substitution. And I, I think that's really important because we know that not everything in the ecosystems are a perfect substitute for everything else. Nobody's ever, I think, really claimed that. But we haven't been sure, I don't think we've been sure that we can pick it up and measure it. And I think what we're showing is we can. So let me, um, so what about sustainability of this fishery? So what I'm showing you here is year on the x-axis, um, euros on the y-axis, this is profit. These are those profit curves I showed you before. You can actually ignore them um, on this slide. Um, the solid lines are the change in intertemporal welfare. The dashed lines are changes in inter intertemporal wealth. Um, the black is the business as usual. The blue is the ecosystem-based management. So one of the things with, there is a constant of integration that drops out of wealth. So what we've done is um, 2013 is when we had data. So we're pretending that it's 2013 that we're assessing here. So we've actually pinned wealth and welfare to be equal at 2013 because it's the changes, not the total value here that matter, okay? Um, and they track each other pretty well. That was good to see. And what we used is that simple arithmetic mean. So maybe that's not a, such a bad approximation after all. We might want to be careful with it in some contexts. The other thing we can see is if we look backwards to 2004 when Poland entered the, the, entered the EU and we have data, generally we would say that wealth and welfare did not decline. It goes up and down, which gives me a bit of heartburn in an interpretation of this, and that's not a question anyone's really asked in this inclusive wealth framework is what happens if wealth goes up and down over time? Is that sustainable or not? Nobody really knows how to answer that. People have flippant answers, I think. Even the experts I ask, and they give an answer, and then they pause and go, well, I'm not sure, right? And it, because people haven't really thought about this. So that's a future area I'm hoping to think more about. So it looks like past management was sustainable, but the switch here looks like we added almost 300 million euros into the Baltic Sea Trust Fund. Okay, we're passing on an extra 300 million euros in, in value. Now, is that because current populations are foregoing 300 million euros worth of use, or is it because we've done something with a change in the institutions just to make the pie bigger? It might be a combination of both. I don't know, but what I can tell you is that we are passing on more opportunities to future generations, is what this is telling me. Okay, the other thing we can see is if we take 2013 as the starting point, then going into the future as business as usual, we might question the future sustainability of this fishery. Whereas if we take this as the starting point, it looks pretty good. Again, it does go up and down. So we have this up and down question that I don't think has really been addressed in this framework. Um, I spent the day talking to you about fish, and uh, we don't talk a lot about fish here at FES. Um, but I wanted to point out that we're actually working on a number of other applications. Um, even with some other people here in the room. So we've been working on groundwater and really thinking about spatial aggregation issues. How, to, how does how you aggregate natural capital over space affect the way we wind up valuing it? Um, we're doing some work on scallops and thinking about how do processes like climate change affect the way that we think about natural capital um, prices because they're sort of external forcers on the system. And we're trying, and so all of this, the fish and these examples, you might think are relatively near market. You don't have to go too many steps away from sort of this non-market natural capital until you enter a market. Um, but we're working right now to say, well, can we make this work on for something like endangered caribou that never actually enter our market? Um, and we're starting to think about some, some forest examples uh, where we can get beyond the timber value. And the timber, when people talk about the natural capital value of forests, they often focus on timber, maybe a little bit of carbon sequestration. And we're trying to push beyond that. Um, in this world of sort of imperfectly allocated resources. So I'm going to stop there. I think that leaves a bit of time for questions. Um, thank you. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the Baltic Sea example. Yep. So one thing about the Baltic Sea, right, is it has a pretty big eutrophication issue. And, um, you know, you can, in a, in a very lo um, big low dissolved oxygen problem, which is going to impact those three fish. And folks are very actively trying to manage that also. And then in your, you know, in your denominator at one point, y you had that, the, the one square that was, um, sort of the ecological system and the physical system. W when do you decide to get into the nuances of that and to play that off against sort of the, hu the human system? 
um, how, like, so for instance, should we be, when do we decide to manage the nutrient problem versus some of the fisheries problems that you were just talking about to get at the same ends? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's an important management question, and I think it's an important of how do we scope out the system, right? What, and again, that's a, what's a substitute for what, right? You could think if we can manage the nutrient problem, maybe that's actually a substitute for some fishery management, right? And I think that it's, it's you know, places like FES where we're training people to actually think that way, and I don't think people have traditionally thought that way. Um, in the case of the Baltic Sea specifically, uh, it turns out some work that's been done on this, particularly on this multi-species um, maximum sustained yield, tends not to be super sensitive to the eutrophication problem. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons people like it. Um, but I certainly could, could think about, well, could you think about that as a, the stock of inflow of eutrophication as another capital asset that would need to be valued? Um, I, I think, you know, we bounded it this way in large part because our goal here was not to go out and assess the Baltic Sea per se. It was to figure out how this would work in a multi-species context. And that was sort of traditionally how the system had been bounded. Thanks for the presentation, Eli. I wonder if you could just kind of clarify that I'm trying to organize the different parts of my head. In your setup, you kind of set up a, a, a value function or the, the wealth function through time. And given the world the way it is being managed, mm -hmm. you then back out the shadow value, the value of the natural capital. If I go to the sustainability question, I want to make sure that I'm not decreasing wealth over time. But don't I already know the answer to that question because I've got to assume the, the uh, value of the objective function in order to get the value of the natural capital? I, I, I don't think you, so I think there's two things there. I, I think you're asking two separate questions, Matt. I think one is, do you have to assume the, the sort of period-specific well-being function? And the other one is, do I already know the answer about the sustainability question? Um, uh, let me start with a sec the second part of what I understood you're asking is um, we don't know that per se, particularly in complicated systems because of these feedbacks. We, I mean, one thing we could do is we could simulate all of this out, right? We, we could run simulations for a given starting value. Um, this can be very computationally intensive um, and say under a whole bunch of assumptions, what's the trajectory? And this is just simulating and forecasting. Um, but what we're able to do is we're able to talk about sort of all possible worlds Right, so we're, we're finding, so there you don't get the price. Might not be important in sort of an economics, in a sort of strict economic evaluation, is this better or worse than one other, other um, program that you might enact. But when you try and take this to talk to the people who are doing sort of sustainability accounting and they want prices that look like the prices they're used to, you need a framework like ours to be able to sort of uh, make that all square. So it's sort of an extension on that. It synthesizes it in that way of sort of simulate scenario simulation. The other thing I'll say is that um, we've chosen, and one of the things that I think you could, you could level a bit of criticism is we've chosen what I like to call near market capital assets, uh, natural capital stocks. These are things that ultimately, you know, dead fish flow into a protein market. Uh, groundwater uh, is an input in production into things like corn and soybeans in our work, right, which then flows into a market. Caribou don't, right? Endangered caribou don't. And so one of the, the I think one of the issues at the heart of um, how we think about sustainability and how we think about well-being is actually increasingly the harder of the two problems. Um, the problem of whose values, whose preferences count. What's the spatial extent of how people are gonna count? How do we do aggregation? Um, one of the problems with, in my opinion, with the experimental ecosystem accounts and the environmental accounts that UN Stat is doing is for countries, what they're actually often doing is they're aggregating up all of the stock and then they're, they're trying to provide a price for that stock. And what um, Ethan Atticott and I have shown is that you can get a very different answer if you price locally and then sum value versus if you sum quantity and then apply a price um, because these aren't linear relationships. So I think there are two parts. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think there's sort of two parts to that. And I think in some, if we're worried about equity issues and things like that, how we define that initial well-being at a point in time is actually really critical. <laughs>